We good? Uh, yes, we're recording. So um, this is going to be a, a kind of a hodgepodge research meeting. Um, I spent, I've been working on some really exciting ideas, and I spent several days trying to make a presentation out of it, and I, I kind of failed. Um, there were too many unknowns, too many things bouncing around. And, and so I said, screw it, I'm just going to present a bunch of ideas and, and make it more of a discussion and, as opposed to a presentation. So I really would like this to be as interactive as possible. Um, and I have a bunch of ideas, but I'm not going to necessarily present them in a logical order. So I apologize for that. Um, before I get started, I, I, I spent an hour talking to Karan last week. And it reminded me of a couple of things. Of course, Karan's new. He's only been here two months. He's never really he's been in the office. He hasn't been around uh, us or the office very much. And so uh, a couple of things came out. I just thought I'd reemphasize again. Um, first of all, I, I realized how uh, a lot of the stuff that those of us have been around for a while have internalized is not internalized by everyone. So many of the, the concepts I'm going to talk about today uh, are certainly not going to be obvious to everybody. <laughs> so I assume Subatai and, and Lewis and, and uh, Marcus will pick up on and Lucas perhaps, but not everybody. Um, and the second thing is that we, we had some conversations about uh, the role of biological details in artificial intelligence. And I just want to reemphasize one more time because um, Karan asked some questions that I often get from people who are new to this field, which is like, he didn't say it this way, so don't, don't take offense, Karan, but it was more like, um, you know, why do, why do these biological details matter? You know, What's wrong with mathematical approaches? You know, why do we consider belief propagation and various probability theories and so on? And of course, we have in the past, um, but but always I, I felt I felt with certainty for over forty years that we're never going to figure out how to really build the machines without understanding the biology in detail. And nothing has shaken my um, opinion about that. So we're going to go through some crazy biological details today. I don't think they're optional. <laughs> I think they're yeah, uh, these kind of every, over and over again. Every time I learn is when people say, "Yeah, I, I got some inspiration from biology, but I don't need to know all the details uh, yet." Um, that leads to obstacles, and you're just not going to get past that. At some point in the future, when I understand enough, we'll be able to say, "Yeah, uh, more biology. More biology doesn't matter." So this stuff I'm going to talk about today, even though it seems crazily biological, um, it, it uh, I don't think these are optional things for AI. You know, uh, this is the, the text here is the, um, um, why the hell I get rid of that thing at the top of the screen here again. The text here, whoops, is uh, just an email I sent out earlier. Um, so I'm going to just start going through this, and then I have a bunch of slides, some of which I had before. So I figured I would go through a quick review of some of the material I presented earlier about how many columns, uh, my phone is ringing, I'm going to just disable that, excuse me one second. Um, uh, move my mouse. You guys see that pop down, don't you? Yeah. Um, we we did, we just see a slide. So if you did something, oh, oh, I see. Zoom is Zoom is showing me stuff that that you're not seeing. It keeps popping down things over my screen. Uh, review of the material I presented before about how many columns might represent um, uh, uh, space and dimensions, and um, and then I'll talk about a bunch of topics. Um, and I'll go through these in the slides ahead here. Uh, I'm looking at them right now. So I, I don't need to read these texts right here. Um, let's just go right into the, to the review, and then I'll come back to this later and see if I missed anything. So just to remind ourselves where we were before, that mini columns uh, are a physical entity of the brain. They exist. They are part of how the brain develops. And, um, and many people have speculated that mini columns are the functional unit of the, of the neocortex, but as far as we know, there really are no um, theories about what mini columns do. Um, there's about 120 cells per mini column, and so there's a lot of mini columns in the human brain. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details here right now, um, but one of the consequences of this is that uh, if a mini column, in theory, has all the cell types, that is, the, a mini column that might have 120 cells, and they have all, they have uh, representatives of all, all the cells. So there aren't other types of cells. They're, they're in the, if you're in the cortex, they're in the mini column. There's some evidence, I think I read once, that says that maybe some of the inhibitory cells, and this is not true, but I have to go back and try to find that. But anyway, the point of this is, is that if, if, if this is true, then every mini column must have 
at least one or more of the types of cells we think about, like grid cells and place cells and orientation cells and, and displacement cells, because if they don't exist in every column, every mini column, then they don't exist, you know, they have to exist in every mini column because every mini column is the same. That's a really interesting constraint to keep in mind. Um, uh, this is just, I'm not going to go through this again, but this is just the argument that people say it is, a, you know, the function of minicron is currently difficult to detect. It is a fundamental processing unit of the cortex. No one knows what it's doing. And that we have a lot of data from V1, uh, not much uh, data from other uh, parts of the brain. So, um, so the hypothesis I've been working on, um, and I've annotated this slide with some new things, is that mini columns represent dimensions of the space being modeled by a column. So the, the, the I'll go through how I got this to this uh, again, but um, it, was, it was an observation that what we think of as complex cells, and we'll talk about it more in a moment, are really, they're, they're sort of, uh, they're scalar representations of movement in a particular direction. And they're not necessarily features of the world, they're more movement vectors. Um, and so each minicom would represent a, a singular dimension, a set, and a set of minicom is an open, complete, uh, basic set of the space. And the, the, the other part of this is that minicoms learn what they represent from their sensory input. That is, they, there are flow and spatial inputs, uh, and I'll go through this again in another slide. That, and so from the sensory data a, a column gets, it can determine what what movement vectors or what dimensions are in the space. Now, a new idea I've been working on, which, is, which wasn't clear to me before, uh, excuse me one second, uh, Janet? Excuse me, Janet. Sorry, she's making noise. Um, that minicoms uh, represent um, movement, and they're not, they're not really dimensions of space. And so, um, and, and I got to this observation by just imagining what kind of flow patterns a column, a visual column could, could learn. And, and it, it's going to learn movements, but it doesn't necessarily learn dimensions of space. And uh, so if I move straight in a, a linear line, it'll, it'll learn that's the type of movement I have. There's a certain flow pattern that appears on the screen when I see that, or my vision system, I see that. Um, but any common movement, if I, if, I had to, if I tended to walk in circles, it would learn to represent that too. And it would also learn to represent changes in orientation as a movement vector. And so it's not correct to think of them as actually sort of like linear dimensions of space. They're really just, you're, you're, you're parsing up the world into movement vectors. And those movement vectors may, may or not correspond to linear dimensions in space. Um, and therefore complex cells represent the speed of movement uh, of a sensor or observer along the minicom's movement dimension. And, um, and every minicom, I'm, I'm gonna go with the idea that every minicom performs a 1D path integration along its movement dimension. Uh, again, uh, the big thing here is, uh, one of the big insights I had recently is that changes in orientation are no different than changes in linear movement. From a comms point of view, changing your orientation is just a different type of movement. It has a different flow pattern on the screen, and, and therefore um, there'll be many columns that represent uh, 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 orientation changes, and, and, it, and those many columns will perform path integration uh, and all the other um, uh, functions we assume that happens with grid cells along its movement dimension. So I, in number six here, I say some minicons will represent changes in orientation. And from a column's point of view, there's no difference between linear movement and movement and orientation. So um, that was a very sort of liberating idea. It made me realize that uh, the changes in orientation, you would, we would also figure out displacements in that. We would do path integration and we'd do displacements and all the other things we think have to happen. So um, I'm going to go into this um, a little bit more detail. Everything I'm thinking about right now is in sort of one-dimensional path integration modules. Um, and so th that's pretty much the, the, the theories that people have about grid cells, that they start off with a, one a multiple one-dimensional path integrations, which then uh, combine to look like a 2D uh, grid cell. And I'm assuming that 2D grid cells are an artifact of later processing. I'm not going to go into that more now. But everything I'm thinking about is, is, is in one-dimensional vectors um, going through this. So that's sort of an overview. I don't think I'm, I'm going to jump into some review some of this, but I don't know if has, anyone has any comments yet before I get going. Can you still hear me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. We can hear some, you. I can't tell. All right. Um, so this I presented this slide before. It's just uh, updated a little bit. Um, this is, has to do with the uh, how we thought of a column in the past. 
where you'd have a column and have some sensory input. It needs to get a motor input from, from some sort of cortical area, uh, and it generates a motor output. And uh, therefore, with this sensory input and a motor input, we can do path integration and build a model of something. Uh, and then the model can control behavior. And the new idea is that there are two types of sensory input, a, sen a sense input, which is a static input, and a sense input, which is a flow input. And that is sufficient to build a model of the world. You do not need anything else. And the, and the sensory flow input is, is a substitute for a motor input. It's basically saying, I'm not getting a motor command. I'm, I'm observing the movements in the world. Therefore, I, I have a, a, a primary data source to say, I can observe what movements are occurring uh, through a sensory input, and I can build my model that way. Um, only later, we can optionally hook this up to um, the central pattern generator subcortically, and so we could get an inference copy of the motor command, which would be a which would be uh, something would be earlier, be quicker. That would be like I'd get that copy of the motor command before the body even starts moving, whereas the sense flow input it's only after I start moving that I can sense that, and so that's what becomes the sort of a second um, a second tier learning phase where you can associate the model um, and the behaviors with the central pattern generator. Um, we talked about the magno and parvocellular cells. I, I don't need to go into them in great detail here, but just remember that there are two basic sensory inputs to, to a visual uh, cortex. There's the magnocellular cells, which are very large respective fields, they're fast response. Uh, they only uh, trigger on onset and offset. There's no tonic response. Uh, those uh, are clearly ideal for doing flow detection. And then there's the parvocellular cells, which are slower. They have narrow receptive fields. They have a tonic response, and these are ideal for feature detection. Um, and I'm going to skip that. Um, now, I mentioned this idea before too. This this whole idea came part with from observing the fact that when you're watching a, like a, if you're watching someone navigate a, a character through some virtual world, or or even not to a virtual world, just watching a movie, and some you're watching a first person view of someone. We lost Jeff. Yeah. Question. Uh, oh, we lost you there for uh, maybe ten seconds. Uh oh, it says my connection is unstable. Uh, let's see if it comes. Can, am I back? Yeah, we hear you. Okay. I'm not sure what you lost, but I need to review anything. Um, let's keep going. So now imagine if all the bits on this screen are moving in one way or another. They could be converging or diverging or sweeping left or sweeping right or rotating in the plane. If all the bits are moving, it means my body is moving relative to the world. That there's only, that's the only explanation. This is like being in an IMAX theater and you're surrounded. And if all the bits are moving on the screen, you feel you're moving. Um, if, however, uh, only a subset of the bits in the field of view are moving, then maybe, maybe uh, some central portion or some, some subfield, um, and then that means your body's not moving. You, you're not moving through the world. If you were moving through the world, every bit would always be moving. Um, but if only some of the bits are moving, uh, then that means my body is stationary relative to the world, and part of the world is moving relative to me. I thought about this a lot. It's a fun exercise to sit there and just look at the world and try to, as you move around, try to imagine which bits are moving in your field of view and which are not. And this seems to be pretty conclusive. Um, that if you if, if all the bits are moving, your body interprets it as you're moving, and if only some of the bits are moving, your body interprets it that your body's not moving relative to the world. Something else in the world is moving. So here you're talking about some central notion of the location of the body. It, it, you know, obviously my hands could be moving. Um, you I'm know, talking I, about the eyes admit. in this case, just the visual eye. Um, you know where my head is. Uh, the same would apply to touch, but I'm not going to develop it here in touch. Um, I, I, I could talk about it more if you want, but I was going to avoid that. Okay. I think everything I'm going to talk about here applies to other sensory modalities. And I haven't spent a lot of time in that, but I've spent enough time to convince myself that everything that I'm talking about here could apply to other sensory modalities. But it's easiest to think about vision because we have more data on vision. Uh, I think this general principle you'll see in a moment applies to everything. That is, when a column is looking at something, even the output of other columns, it's going to have these two field of views. It's going to have a large one and a small one, and it's going to be building models based on those two field of views. Um, 
This is the general way people look at a coracal column. This is very old school, a long, long time. Uh, first thing is just to remind you, people think of a cortical column or the layers in the cortex, if you will, as divided to two basic categories, the upper layers and the lower layers, the, the, um, you know, the infragranular and the su uh, supergranular uh, layers. And, um, and then within those, we see um, two uh, basic cell types, which have been characterized, complex cells and simple cells. And um, complex cells are movement-related, they're, they're movement-related cells always. And, um, and, I, and I gave you some uh, uh, real biological evidence for how, why those, are, those should be viewed as flow detection cells. Um, uh, and where simple cells are really not um, flow detection, they're more um, uh, static pattern. Um, um, the upper layers have a narrower field of view and the lower layers have a larger field of view. That's another general characteristic. I can show the papers on that again, but a much larger field of view in the lower layers. And so this is the way it's, it, it basically looks like you have complex and simple cells on the above. You have complex and simple cells below, but below in layer six is a bunch of different types of cells. There's simple cells and other things too. Um, there's of course these, these communications between specific layers between the upper and lower um, parts of the, the layer, laminar structure. And we've talked about these a lot in the past about uh, the purpose of these in, or in our papers as well. Um, but the point is that you have these two sort of separate systems that, that kind of look like separate systems, but they're, they're bidirectionally connected in multiple ways. Um, and the general theory we're working on here is that when people talk about the inputs to a particle com, they usually mention layer four, that's the primary input layer, but then there are actually, it's been very well documented that these other inputs so right at the bottom of layer three and right at the bottom of layer five. And um, it's been shown that like the, the input at the bottom of layer three is sufficient for generating complex cells. You don't need any input into layer four. So the idea that, that complex cells are derived from simple cells is not true. So complex cells are derived, must be derived from that upper input there. So the theory that we're working on here, um, uh, and I have no data to suggest this, is that the, um, that, there, that the two different the parvo and the magno cellular layers are projecting um, uh, to, differently to these inputs. And so the parvo cellular layer would be going to the layer four, which is your spatial pattern you're detecting, uh, and you'd have two different um, magno cellular layers uh, inputs uh, to define. Um, uh, I don't think this is true. I think magno and parvo both go to layer four. Well, you know, it's interesting. Okay. Um, as I said, I don't have any specific evidence for this. Um, but logically, this makes sense. You know, I, I've asked uh, a couple of people in the past, is there any, you know, like, well, mostly Murray Sherman, but maybe some others, I can't remember. Is there any differentiation between the, the uh, uh, where the different laminar of the thalamus project in the cortex? And he said no. But I'm not sure I believe him. In the same way that, you remember how last time I presented the data that complex cells are not um, orientation selective, they, they work equally well with random bit patterns. In fact, they work better with random bit patterns. So it's possible that, um, and that's, so the common belief about complex cells is wrong. It's just wrong. There's data, there's data that people forgot that says that's not how they work. They work differently. And so um, I, 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 I'm not sure I want to believe the data here yet to the time. Because um, there's good theoretical reasons to, to, to explain why it should be like this. Uh, I'm not denying it yet. I'm just working through the theory and what the theory would tell me. And we come back later and see is, is the data really conclusive about this? And what does the data tell us? Um, you know, it's possible that I could have magno parvocellular inputs to layer four, and, that, and, I, and the theory could accommodate that, but I, I'm not thinking about that yet. Um, I think the idea that they're there, that the parvo and magno uh, cellular layers are treated equally in the cortex is almost patent. It has to be false. What's the point of having them if there are no differentiation? If they're differentiated in the retina, they're differentiated in the thalamus, they're differentiated, you know, why would they not be, they're just going to be mixed together when you get to the cortex? It seems almost impossible. No, I, th um, I think they are, I think they're kept separate in L4, but it's just uh, like there's some cells. Oh, that, oh so that, you're that saying should be, get there, there may be, there, there's maybe two different projections to layer four. Like I, that's some, what I thought, yeah. Interesting. I mean, I have actually found no data yet on what, what the input to the, to the lower layer three and the lower layer five are. I mean, they just say it comes from the thalamus. Um, so maybe there's some data on that too. Well, if you know, if you had a paper on that, it'd be great. Um, uh, I'd love to learn about that. 
Is there any sense that uh, what's the overlap between the Magno and Parvo? In, 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 are, they, is, are they just randomly oriented with respect to each other in terms of their receptor fields or is one centered over another or is there any relationship between yeah, them? Yeah, well, the way they do this is they, they show a heck of an anesthetized animal or maybe not anesthetized, they take an animal and they, and they put some, typically put a sinusoidal grating at, at some orientation, right? Or they have a bar or line, maybe if there's a bar and line. And then uh, they find cells that respond and then they make that bar wider, wider and wider. And then they see when the cells stop responding and when they keep responding and so on. So the testing methodology assumes that these are all centered at the same point in space, which I think makes sense. Um, um, but the testing methodology is also flawed in the sense that, uh, again, this idea that uh, complex cells respond to orient line orientations that are moving is false. It's, it's that they respond to anything moving in that direction, including random bits. And so, um, but the way they test it makes it seem like it's receptive field is, is uh, oriented. Um, but anyway, I think, I'm not sure if I answered your question, um, Kevin, but the idea is these are all centered. It's just that the lower layers have a much broader receptive field. Uh, it's, it's basically, um, I was just trying to think of when you say centered, if, if I was looking at a very narrow receptive field, could I identify the parvo associated with that? And then there is an equivalent magno that maybe surrounds it. And it's some, there's some I, I, relationship. I think, I, think, I think all they know is they look at the receptive fields of the cells themselves. I don't know about them looking at the, um, the actual magno parvo. Uh, like you'd have to look in the thalamic layers to determine which uh, the alignment there. But right. I think the assumption I, is that they're aligned. Yeah, I found a paragraph in uh, Thompson um, that that talks about that. Uh, about so she, yeah, so she says uh, axons from the magnocellular layers of the LGN with large receptive fields project to a subdivision of layer four C, and sometimes to only one half of the depth of that sublayer, uh -huh. as, well as, uh -huh. to, as well as to layer six. Um, this input probably underlies the vigorous responsiveness of its cells to motion. Axons from the parvocellular layers with small receptive fields, on the other hand, terminate in layer 4C, beta, 4A, 3B, and in layer 6. Okay, so that's interesting. Uh, Which paper? Is that one of her review papers, or what is that? Yeah, yeah, it's the interlaminar connections in the neocortex, 2008. Okay, so that's interesting because in, in primate vision, we have this, this, these extra layer 4 cells which some people have argued is mislabeled, that they really shouldn't be called layer four cells, they should be called uh, extra layer three cells, is what some people have argued for that. Um, but so there, they're still being, um, they're still separated, right? So we don't, we don't know why there's, there are extra layers in V1, the striate V1. Um, presumably, it's for good reason, not all mammals have striate V1, so it's not always required. Um, and I'm not even trying to address that at the moment. I think the point we can say though, is that they're still segregated. So Thompson said, arguing they're still segregated. Uh, they're just in a different, calling a layer A, B, and C, or whatever, um, it's still segregated. Is that, would that be correct? Supertar? Do I lose you? Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I mean, Parvo is associated with color vision. Right. Um, yes. So animal, mammals that don't have color pro vision probably don't have parvo inputs at all. No, I would argue they do. Uh, the point of this is that parvo is not about color. Parvo is about um, um, static properties that can be observed visually. So whether that's a line or color, it doesn't really matter. It's, just, it's, it's, a, it's a property of the feature, the observed feature of that point in space. Um, so you still need parvo. It's not just about color. You'd still need parvo because they are, they remember they have a tonic response. I could go back to this. They have a tonic response that is, um, it's not just, it, it, you could do without color. You still need a tonic response, slow responding, um, uh, basically a, a feature that can be detected. Where the mango cellular cells are uh, only respond on and off and um, in a very fast response. And so if, you, if the eye stops moving for a second and you fixate, then the magnocellular cells stop, stop firing. But the parvocellular cells continue to fire. My, my recollection was that um, 
when you go across species of, of mammals that the number of interdigitated layers of parvo and magno changes. Uh, I think I it's was, really just whether they have a, my impression, you might be right to have, my impression is that there's a difference between mammals that have a striate V1 and mammals that don't have a striate V1. So okay. I don't know if that's this, there may be a correlation between that and also the lamina in the, in the, uh, um, in the thalamus. By the way, you know, if I, I could go bring up that slide, I have it here. Um, 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 let me just find it real quickly. Somewhere I have that slide on the thalamus. Oh, where is it? Oh, this one here, I passed it earlier. Um, remember, there's like four, uh, there's four parvocellular layers and there's two magnocellular layers and they, they alternate the left and right eye. So there can be a lot going on here in the thalamus. This is a picture of the thalamus in the optic nerve tracks, really. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm trying to stick to the real um, sort of theoretical implications of all this as opposed to, um, um, you know, I'm just gonna leave it at that. Well, I was, I was just thinking if some of that is related to the, uh, uh, taking uh, uh, stereo inputs for, uh, from the various portions of the retina, is that yeah. is that's what's going on there in the same way that It you... might be, although again, as I said before, I'm going to try to avoid any concept of stereo vision as a requirement for this theory because it, it's, uh, it's not required. And you can see really well without, without two eyes. It helps, but you don't, have to, you don't need two eyes to see. And the I'm, two I'm eyes just... thing I'm talking about. The the only thing I'm looking at is is the the whether there's anything more that's happening besides stereo with those 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 uh, layered structures. Yeah, probably. We, I mean, we don't understand what the thalamus is doing, there. and and so there's clearly a lot going on there that we don't understand. So I, I, I I'm, what I'm trying to do is take a very theoretical approach to this and trying to figure out what must be happening. Right. But and I, I'm trying. I'm trying to leverage what you're saying because yeah. you can get a sense of motion, you know, from those optical layers. But the fact that there's more than just two, it's not like it's in in the neocortex where you have left, right, you know, yeah. Uh, bifurcation. Yeah. But there, there's other types of of motion that's being being dealt with in there, other than just the pure visual. Oh, know, I, it's not clear. What, what? How do you? Why do you know that? How do you say there's other types of motion? I, I'm 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 saying that if I infer that stereo is happening there, and that you're basically differentiating between uh, left and right visual fields, I'm just thinking that there might be additional processing there. That, in 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 your sense of generalizing motion to not this being like visual motion, but any sort of sensorial motion, I'm just wondering if there is a argument to be made that. The intricacy of that structure means that it's processing different types of deltas, if you wish. Maybe I think it's possible. Although we would want to look and see what is equivalent in the thalamus for um, for touch, for example, uh, because yeah. that's there's no stereo touching, if you will. Um, auditory could be similar uh, to vision. Um, so there's no doubt about it. But from a theoretical point of view, I don't want to rely on having two sources like uh, you know. If I think about a cortical region higher up in the cortex, it's not getting input from the eyes directly or anything. It's just getting from other regions. And so we need a very generic understanding of what's going on here. So, um, yeah. But let's, let's keep going. I think this idea that, that you, the cortical input column gets input uh, of, of these two different sources, I mean, a, a sort of a, a motion source and a static source, and also that there are two different uh, size receptive fields is, is would apply, could apply everywhere in the cortex um, and not just sensory input. It's a general purpose way of modeling space. If I think about it uh, this way, if I think about it additionally to primary or secondary visual cortex, where uh, as I argued earlier, if all the bits moving, a very large receptive field is moving, that's an egocentric movement. And, um, and if every, uh, if only a subset of the field of bits of, of flow is moving, then that's going to be an allocentric movement. Um, it's going to be moving of something in the world. And so now we can see right here that we have 
uh, in every cortical column, this is argued that we have every cortical column is dealing with this transformation between one reference frame space and another reference frame space. Um, which in, in this point, we can call it egocentric and allocentric. It's not clear to me all the parts of the cortex we want to use that term, uh, but that's what uh, that's what's happening here. And we should, in our model of the cortical column, we should we should assume that this has to be solved in this space, which I think is a very a sort of liberating idea that, okay, we have to solve this problem in the cortical column as well. But it seems to be set up for that. Uh, of course, there's an egocentric motor command coming out of layer five. I say it's egocentric because um, it's in layer five, it's not in layer three. Um, so uh, that's consistent with that as well. So, um, so I'm, I'm thinking that every column converts back and forth between ego and allocentric reference frames, uh, or more generally between a larger space and independent smaller space. Um, and um, uh, two different moving things in the world, if you will. Uh, I think I'm going to just skip that and then I'll skip that. I want to go back to um, uh, my list of things at the top here. Uh, I'm going to talk about this number five here. Again, I've already mentioned this, but I, I think this is a really big idea um, that I've started thinking. If, if there's two things going on here, imagine these uh, magnetic bits are coming into the cortex. One thing that's interesting about them is they're not, they're not directionally sensitive in the thalamus. So the, the cortex isn't getting directionally sensitive bits. It's just getting um, bits that are changing on and off very rapidly because the inputs are changing on and off. It's, it's, there's no directionality to it. So someone has to determine there's a flow. Someone has to say, oh, these bits are going on and off. They're not just random. There's a flow. There's a movement to them. Uh, something's moving across the field of view in some direction. And um, that apparently has to happen in the cortex. So right at the moment, we don't have a mechanism for that. Um, I proposed earlier, I said, hey, these magnetoscopic bits could be coming in. And we run it through a spatial pool type process. Um, and that spatial pool type process will figure out a, a set of movement vectors that represents the, all the possible flow patterns. Um, but in addition, there has to be something that says, hey, I'm not getting flow bits. I'm getting it's on and off bits. And I have to somehow determine that a sequence of these is occurring very rapidly as movement occurs. And I only mention this because, well, it has to occur. <laughs> and there are, there are observations about um, uh, pyramidal cells that say that the order in which the activation along a dendrite occurs um, uh, is, is important. That is, if you have a pattern going from distal to proximal along the dendrite, the cell will respond much more strongly than if it was going the other way or wouldn't respond at all going the other way. We have not accommodated these in our theories of the dendrites and the neurons so far. Uh, but this is suggestive that we're going to have to have something like that. And that is, uh, there is data on that which suggests that there may be inherent to at least some of the cells in the cortex, this directionality, very fast directionality dependent movement, because the cortex has to determine that these, this sequence of bits that are going on and off fairly rapidly as your eyes move, or as things in the world move, um, has to be detected in the neurons, and, and we currently don't have a method for that. Um, so that has to occur. Um, but then the other thing is that's, that's in here, and I mentioned this uh, bullet number five is, and I've said this before, is that to me also nice, you know, in, when we think about the uh, hippocampal complex, we think of head direction cells as one thing and, and grid cells as another. thing. They're like two different worlds that have to interact. And we've drawn pictures, I've drawn pictures in the past of saying, oh, well, now, to know which way my grid cells ought to be updated, I need to know which way the orientation cells are. And, and there's sort of two different things. I've come to think that this may be all, at least in the cortex, I can't say this for the hippocampal complex, but I think this is a false distinction. I think that, um, that when you think about the flow patterns that the cortex may see, they can't tell the difference between a flow pattern that means change in orientation and a flow pattern that means I'm moving forward and moving backwards. They're just flow patterns. It, the cortex doesn't know this. It just discovers whatever flows are out there and it makes, it runs through a spatial pool type process and says, okay, these are the movements that I'm observing. But it doesn't know that one movement is an orientation change and another movement is um, linear or something else. It'll just learn to represent your very behaviors. And so this study made me think of like, what if I just say there is no distinction between head direction cells or orientation cells? And what if it just, there's just movement vectors. And those movements do not have to correspond to linear dimensions in space. So we have a physical space, a 
bunch of X, Y, Z type of dimensions, if you want to consider it that. But that's not what the cortex is representing. The cortex is representing movements through that space, and which may or may not capture the dimensionality of the real space. It depends on how I move. Um, but it models everything in these movement vectors, not in spatial dimensions. So there are movement dimensions, but they're not spatial dimensions. They're not necessarily correspond to linear dimensions in the space of the object that's being modeled. Uh, and this is a very liberating idea. Uh, all of a sudden, I can start thinking about uh, orientation completely independently. It's not really orientation. It's just movement vectors. And um, some will correspond to turning. And some, I could have a movement vector. It might be a spiral motion or, uh, and so on. Whatever is observed, that's what's going to be represented. And then I can think about then um, everything that applies to what we think about applies to grid cells, such as a path integration and displacement cells um, are, are occurring in all these dimensions of movement, including what we might call a change in orientation. So if I was thinking about a head direction cell and I'm moving left and right, sweeping left and right, um, and the head direction cell would be changing, well, it's really just doing path integration in that uh, movement vector. And I would also calculate displacements between, if I want to do it, you know, figure out the uh, relative uh, uh, displacement of one space and another space, I would do it across all these dimensions, including orientation. So I would represent changes in orientation as part of a displacement vector. Um, uh, and, um, and I've been working through this, and I think this solves the orientation problem in uh, displacement cells that we've talked about uh, in the past. So I haven't been able to work that out in great detail yet, but I, I, I'm convincing myself that it, it would happen. Uh, I don't, that's a big idea. I don't know if anyone has questions about that before I go on. I mean, I, I'm, I'm following and it just, it, it seems like you're really kind of changing what, it, what these spaces are doing. It's no longer a physical space in the world. It's more of a, it's a different kind of space. Uh, and I, I like it. I like this direction. It seems much more um, capable. <laughs> Good. I want you to like it. Hope, I'm hoping you like it. Um, it does seem it, it's a it, it, and that captures it. It's, it's this idea that we we've always I've always thought about you know these things representing physical space, but that's not really what's going on. And so now you this you know there's always been this problem in my mind between physical space and movements and how you go back and forth between them. And in some sense, you don't. You just stay in movement space that everything is calculated in movement space. So path integration works in movement space. And I don't need to, when I ask myself, uh, it's, it's no longer correct to say, well, how do I determine how, if I'm moving some way, if I'm moving forward, how do I determine which way I'm moving in, um, in physical space? It's, I don't need to answer that question. I just moving this direction in this, uh, in this movement space. And by the way, uh, each of these, um, um, these, I'll call them one-dimensional path integrations, they have to re-anchor all the time, just like we do with people talk about good cells. And so, but I can, I can somehow, it's it, a lot of problems that come about trying to go back and forth in movement in space to disappear when you work all in this movement point in space. Um, let's say, uh, so number six is what we just talked about. Uh, Minicom represents a 1D movement vector um, in only, in only, it only means that path integration displacements are in 1D. It's not that there is, that this one dimension is like a dimension in space, or even it's a linear dimension in space. It's just the movement space. I've been kind of struggling with a, a term. I, I want to call these like 1D grid cells, but they're not really grid cells, and, and it's very confusing. So I've been calling them like path integration cells or something like that. I don't know what to call them. Um, um, and then the set point number seven I've already made, how path integration and displacements apply uh, and define orientation of all every type of movement. Uh, I don't know that's what's going on in the hippocampal complex. Maybe the hippocampal complex has got more of a, a specific solution. Uh, but I would, if I had to guess, I would guess that we've been mis misinterpreting what's going on in the hippocampal complex. Um, remember when people look for grid cells, they're actually, there are far more cells that are combinations of grid and orientation and so on than there are pure grid cells. <laughs> And, um, and even the pure grid cells don't work reliably as grid cells, as we've shown in the tank paper. So um, it, it's, it's more like people are looking for these grid cells because they found them and then they keep looking for them. But the vast majority of cells actually don't look like that. They look like some combination of stuff that this is what we would predict in this, this new view here. Um, One other connection I would make to enterrhinal grid cells is that um, 
uh, running with this idea for a while could explain, um, you might, we might wind up with a solution to why grid cells are often distorted, why the grids aren't always just these clean metric grids, but uh, stranger. Oh, uh, that's a good point. You're right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we are trying to apply grid cells as this, oh, there's this really beautiful linear metric thing we put on top of a space, right? But, but they're not, as you point out. They're kind of weird and distorted, and they do those various things. And um, they're often only really nice if you put them in a really clean environment, where 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 the rat is always just randomly walking around, where you're m carefully making sure they went randomly walk around by dropping treats all over the place yeah. randomly. Yeah. So it's kind of a special case where it's a nice metric. Yeah. And I think, by the way, I think the whole two dimensionality of grid cells is also an artifact. I think what's going on, and I, I can't work this on detail, but I mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. I think everything happens in one dimensional spaces, one dimensional movement vectors. So why would you see a 2D grid cell? It's because, well, we, as the hybrid models have shown, we need some sort of uh, continuous attractor model to uh, make things stable, like to keep, the, you know, to keep the stable activity when the animal's not moving, essentially. Um, and so I think what's going on is somehow, they're take, we're taking all these 1D vectors and we're projecting them onto um, a, a planar CAN a continuous attractor model. And so it, I don't understand it yet, but I think that's some, in theory, that's what's going on. And so if we look at those cells, we say those cells are actually being, getting input from a whole bunch of these one dimensional path integrated cells. And so it's, it's somehow providing the stability to them. It's like, it's like I'm taking these 1D vectors, I'm projecting them down into a 2D, a 2D physical space in the cortex putting a can on it so I can maintain stability, but then I would probably project back to the individual path integrated neurons uh, for movement and so on. So it's, it's this whole idea that the that grid cells are literally two, really representing two dimensions in space. It's, it's an artifact. It's the path integration doesn't occur in 2D. Path integration occurs in 1D. And, and all, the, all the models about how we create grid cells just make that assumption. They're all making the assumption that we have these you know, voltage controlled oscillators in one dimension that we take a bunch of them intersect and then you have a 2D grid cell. Um, anyway, I think what's really interesting about this, and I'm gonna run out of steam here, is, is um, I've been I started off by trying to understand how we could do displacements. Because um, I, think, I think displacements are, are, are absolutely happening in the brain. We, we have to go between a, a, a specific, I have a slide on that? I can't remember if I put a slide on there. I was working on this. Let me see if I have something on there. No, I don't have a slide on it today. I have drawings of it in my notebook. <laughs> um, this, um, let's just blank that for a second. Um, just recall, you know, we were trying it with displacements. We were trying to figure out how it is we can do composite objects, like the coffee cup with the logo. And we were struggling with this. How is I can represent a new object by saying, here's one object, which is a logo, and another object, which is a coffee cup, and how to make a new object, which is the combination of the two. And I want to do that very quickly and with very few synapses. And so I can't remember who came up with it. I know that Scott was involved and Marcus, you were involved. I don't know if, if UA was still here or not at the time. But anyway, you guys came back with this proposal for grid, what I call displacement cells. And, and displacement cells basically said, hey, if I have two different locations, I can, I can calculate an invariant representation that shows the relationship between them. That is, um, and, so, uh, and so if I had a bunch of this, grid cell modules and I had a bunch of displacement cell modules, then I'd have a, a very simple and unique representation for the, how the logo aligns with the coffee cup. The problem with that is it only worked if the two spaces were exactly the same sort of uh, size and they did no changes in orientation between them. So it was the right idea, but it had some very serious flaws and we pointed those out in our papers. We pointed out that it doesn't really work for scale and uh, rotation, um, so it needed more work. I, I'm thinking, so I started trying to solve that problem. And the first thing I did was I said, let's try to do, I, I, and I don't have any slides on this. I said, let me try to do um, uh, scale in a one dimension. Like imagine I have a one dimensional space and I want to represent two one dimensional objects um, at different scales. And, um, and so there, uh, there clearly has to be a mechanism to do that that allows me to change the scale of an object um, to, 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 and I think this is going on in the thalamus. We, we, we have a mechanism for this or a proposed mechanism that you could change the, the, the theta frequency and that would change the scale of something. 
And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that even to do basic inference, you have to have a scale factor. That scale is an inherent part of the problem of doing inference and learning and displacements. And so the, the working hard assumption we have is that scaling is occurring in the interaction between the cortex and the thalamus. So um, I didn't solve that problem. Then I started thinking about the, 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 the change in orientation of the logo on the coffee cup. And I think this new way of thinking about um, movement vectors solves that problem. That is, if you, if you take all the displacements, including displacements of, uh, of orientation, um, then you can, look, you can learn quickly assess um, the orientation of an object relative to another object. Um, and I, could, I thought about that. I don't have, there's some complexity to it, but I think it works. And so now I, now I basically have to say, okay, we have to add in this sort of scalar part as well. And then I think you have all the components that are necessary uh, to make this work. Um, so, the more I thought about this, I, I'm pretty confident this whole thing I just talked about is correct. I, you know, I, even though there's very little data about it, it's just one of these things that just hangs together so well. It's so many problems and constraints that um, it seems right to me. Um, and as I dig into it, I find more and more physical evidence that supports it, even though you know some of it's equivocal. Anyway, so that's that's all I have for today. I, I just felt like I needed to talk about this in, in a group. <laughs> and um, and just see if I could present it and make some sense of it. And I'm struggling with how to talk about it, what's the right process. If I wanted to write this up, how would I write it up? Uh, I don't really know. So I thought maybe just presenting it today would help me think about that. And I'd love to hear questions and more comments if you have it um, or debate. Yeah, so I have one other one connection I want to draw here. Uh, and, and for me, it's almost tempting for me to collapse your idea onto this other thing, but I, I'm keeping them separate right now. Um, the, the, another area like known as manifold learning uh, where you map you know sensory inputs into some low dimensional Euclidean space it, it might be 2d might be 3d might be 6d whatever um, this this has a lot of resemblance to that and um, and at least one thing I want to contribute back from the from that idea so something um, Bruno has been Bruno's group has been doing recently uh, I think with the Yibo Sun um, uh, they use the idea that, um, that your sensory input, you, you receive a sensory input, it should activate what we might call a location in a space, but like a, a state in a, in a Euclidean space. Um, and the way to picture kind of what they're doing is if you think of a continuous attractor, if you think of like right now, there's a bump of activity somewhere in a long sheet, um, and your various sensory inputs are mapped to various parts on that sheet. On that sheet, uh, and the thing that they, um, the thing that they, kind of optimize for, the thing that they train for, is they want that bump to tend to move in straight lines, and and to tend to move at constant rates. Why is uh, that? So, so, um, let's see. This is a way of mapping the sequences of the world into directions in a, in a space. And so why, why would it have to be a constant rate? I guess I didn't understand that. Um, that was surprising. I see. It, does it aid in prediction if it's a constant rate? That it does aid in prediction. Yes, that that makes it where you can kind of predict what's next by always moving the bump of activity across the can at a constant rate. So that's know, one answer. I guess I still don't understand why, a, the, why the constant rate would make that difference. If you move slowly, you still make the prediction. It's, uh, uh, if it's not essential, I don't know. You just you made a point of saying it. And I'm like, oh, it's not, I don't understand it. So. I see. I mean, that that is a good reason though, because that lets you predict multiple steps ahead. Uh, by by, uh, you, you don't have to have the constant feedback of seeing if your predictions are right. You can predict what's going to happen ten seconds from now, or at maybe a shorter time span. But the the constant rate part is, uh, I don't know. This is just your. This is just a principle for mapping sensory inputs into a space and figuring out what are the directions of the space. Here the directions would be like the mini columns, uh, an individual mm. mini column would be a direction. Um, but so it's kind of, you're, you're kind of um, loosing the restrictions on what a space is. Like it's not like str a strict space of the world, uh, but we need some kind of restriction. We need some principle telling us uh, what it should be. Uh, so, so like if an animal moves in kind of a strange motion or something like that, maybe this should cause a straight line, uh, but if they're as they're as they're curving, 
maybe in, uh, you can bring up other examples. You could bring up like um, when I've thought about it a little bit, I've thought about um, what, what do soccer players maps of a, of a soccer field uh, look like a straight line on their continuous attractor may not be a straight line on the field. A straight line on their continuous tractor may go kind of curve around and go toward the goal. Yeah, like that. Uh, and <laughs> I, exactly. It, it, it might only need to be piecewise linear, you know, for some time span, so that yeah. you have some degree of predictability, and but you still might have a sense that if you know you see a line continuing to infinity, you know, and it's static, then you might be able to hold that and saying I can kind of keep that prediction going and go off and look at what's delta you know other things are going on so i i i, 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 I know a little confused i still don't quite understand that Kevin, but maybe maybe I don't well even... no no i think i think you might get get it really well like once once you've brought in the um the idea that orientation is just like another direction this has to be piecewise linear it has to be something the way you're always kind of reacting yeah, I, I, it, it's not just it. i mean linear linear in, in is linear to what i guess it's like to me if I, if the way I would phrase it, you've got flow bits on the screen and the, the, your view, and those are moving in some pattern. That pattern has to continue. <laughs> that pattern can't change in the middle of, for one mini column, one dimension. It's like if I'm turning, if I'm turning left, that, that column would always represent turning left. It can't represent turning left one moment and then facing up another moment. Right? It, you can go left faster or slower turning left. I can move slowly to the left or I can turn quickly to the left, but the same flow patterns occurring. Uh, to me, that's that. That to me, if that's what you mean. So it's to me, it's not piecewise linear. It's continuous. If I think about linear in the movement vector, it's it's always linear in the movement vector. It's it's weird. It's because it's not a line. But 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 happen. if you're looking at them in, in combinations, you know, and how one projects on the other, and how you know this one's active, and then it becomes less active. And you, yeah. So the way so, I handle that, it's like that's how I think about the spatial cooler, Kevin. If I, if I have a pattern that morphs into another pattern, well, a different set of mini columns become active. So any particular movement, but imagine I'm moving through space, and let's say I have 200 mini columns. Some subset of them will be active at different rates. Um, uh, a, the, the, a mini column that's representing um, um, you know, forward movement will be partially activated if I'm, if I'm moving and turning to the left. Or, um, and so you'll have like, you'll be, you'll be a combination. You're always gonna get like a sparse a representation of uh, uh, graded responses from a set of, a subset of the mini column. But the individual mini column will always represent the same thing. And so if I stop turning and I wanna go forward now, then that mini column that was representing turning is gonna be silent. It's not gonna have any activity at all. Um, where, you know, so, so I don't think, for this to work, for path integration to work, and path integration has to work in this situation, um, then it seems that the, the, the individual mini comp can only represent one type of uh, uh, flow pattern, if you will. And no, I, I, I agree. I'm just wondering how they get combined. You know, they can't. No, it's, it's just say, the spatial pooler does that. The spatial pooler just guarantees that you're going to pick a subset that best represents, you know, end winners um, that best represent the current movement. Pattern. Right. That, that's selectivity, but I'm thinking about how you learn the thing. If there is something is basically, let, let's use your left turn example. So you're going along one direction, and then if I was just thinking, you know, mentally as, you know, how this, you know, direction projects upon, you know, like a, like a, you know, co you know, cosine type of thing, it's going to respond less and less to that thing and more and more with something else. So you have spatial poolers in front of both of the things, say I'm, I'm, I'm moving in this direction, I'm moving in this orthogonal direction, and I'm just wondering the the notion of having made a left turn by I'm active here, then I'm active over here. If that's something that can be learned in your model, well, I I, I don't know. I'm not sure I understand the question. Remember, the spatial pooler is a continuously learning system, and it just tries it tries to figure out the a common basis set of patterns, and um, and it'll if the pattern change, it changes. Uh, what it learns changes. Um, but it's, it's basically trying to figure out, you know, a, sub, a set of the most common patterns that it can observe. And so I don't, that same issue uh, applied when we use the spatial cooler for static patterns as it would apply here. So I think, I, 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 again, in the end, at any point in time, a minicom would represent a particular type of pattern. 
Um, and if the behavior of the animal changes, and then that behavior, you know, if the animal started walking in circles all the time, well, then it would change, those patterns would change. But again, I'm, I'm not sure if you're arguing that the column has to do both. I'm not sure if you're arguing about that. Well, I, that's why I'm kind of thinking that, you, that you're arguing that it, it, it both, you know, learns this one dimensional thing, but also learns what the semantics of, of that are so that it then recognizes more complex things on top of that. Now, I think uh, the mini column doesn't represent anything more semantic, it doesn't represent anything semantic or anything like that. It's just a, it's just, in this case, it's just a flow pattern, it seems. And oh, okay. the semantics, the semantics comes later. Essentially, the mini columns are defining a space, but the space is a bunch of movement vectors. It's not, okay. a, it's not a bunch of linear dimensions. Um, so, so, so the next layer above that, the semantic layer is what, at the column level? Well, or? yeah, again, it's, this gets back to the thousand brain theory. Eventually, you see, once I have a space, I can assign observed things that, to that space. And in the end, we actually want to assign okay. other okay. spaces. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be reference frames of reference frames. Um, but the semantic, well, I, I have the word semantic, but the, the, right at the moment, I've just described how you structure a space. And that same basic space is going to be used by all objects observed by that mini column. I mean, by that column. Yeah. The column is going to say, I have a, I have a set of movement vectors, and that movement, set of movement vectors is going to be applied to everything I've seen in the world, everything I might see in the world. Right. And, um, and so it's just a space. It has no other meaning other than it's like, here's a set of movements, and these define the space I'm in. We then have to take the, the spatial observations of what's going on or other to build up a model of, the, of a, that has more we might call semantic meaning to it. Yeah, um, and, and I, was, I was jumping ahead to that, but I, I have no problems with, at all with, with your notion of the mini column representing flow uh, or you know, whatever you want to call uh, it. It's really, it's, it's, the way that I think of it is you can call it a movement vector, but it's really a common flow pattern observed in the input. And so it's one of the more common flow patterns, and that is we're going to call that a movement. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I, I was I was thinking of more, but flow 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 is probably uh, uh, it has less uh, semantic trappings to it, so that that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, back to your point about the uh, um, about this manifold theory, uh, Marcus. If, if if that was if you have a paper that you think I should read. Send it to me. Um, I'll point you to a paper. It's it's written in a very um, once again like eigen kind of language, yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. but <laughs> I, I will point you to it. You know, I don't do well like that, that stuff, but it's, uh, I'll try. Yeah, um, I, I I think the interesting thing that Marx is bring, bringing up is is that you Jeff have defined a space, and it's a question of what navigation looks like in that space uh, when something uh, departs from, say whatever the thing that was exciting along this one dimension thing goes someplace else. You have all these other things that are now responding instead of that. And can you say anything? Can you visualize or represent I'm still, something? I'm still lost about that. I mean, animal moves in different directions all the time, right? So the, I'm, I'm still confused by your comment. I don't see I, I, by, by, by that, I mean different flows. In other words, you, you. If I saw a flow that I never saw before. Yeah. Like something really weird. Um, then I, I would still represent it in the spatial cooler, but it wouldn't be the best representation. It would still work, um, and, but it, 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 we did a lot of work with the spatial cooler many years ago, and it's a, maybe we have a deep sense of it, how it works, but, um, but you know, even a non-learned spatial cooler works. It's like you just, you can have, start off with a random parceling of the input, but it gets right. better if you have training. So, it's not like the system would fail. Of, of all of a sudden, I started seeing input patterns occur that, um, you know, maybe I have some physical defect and, and I start walking always, never in a straight line, I'm always working sort of semi curve or something like that. Um, well, um, at first, it wouldn't be the best representation I have in my brain. I would be confused at times, but, but it would learn that and it would, but it would work. It wouldn't be. A failure. I don't know how to better describe it than that. I mean, the spatial pool always parses up the input into something meaningful. No matter, no matter how it's set up, even randomly, it'll do it. No, I, I wasn't suggesting it would, it, would, it, would, it, would, it would fail. I was, I was looking at is that you, you've, you've staked out, you've staked out a, a space where all these things have, have flows and in, you can represent that as a, as a giant, um, you know, 
you know, hyperdimensional vector that all these things have certain, you know, you know, we speak to something that is received, received input and it's either active or not active or less active or active. And, and that's, that I, it's fine. I, I, I can believe that at the cellular level, there's, there's no semantics and you would want to see something, you know, you, you want to feel something like that. I, I think what, what Marcus is trying to do is that uh, if you take that as a, as a very high dimensional space, are there organizational principles that you can pull from the math in that space that might actually reflect the, the, uh, the next order up where you go up to the complex cell, excuse me, where you go up to the, uh, uh, to the column are, are things like that kind of intuited, inferred and learned in some way that we could actually say something about it, you know, and say this operation is going on. It could be a language to express that. It could be. Although as I started off in my comments here, I find that the, the language of math, in my case at least, it always has to follow the understanding, the intuition of what's going on at a mechanism level. And that I've never been able to have the math lead me to the right place. It's, it, the math basically colors and, and describes better um, something I already understood but if I follow the math, then you end up with, with principles that almost never match the biology. So that's, it's just my bias, but I think it's held up over time. Well, in, so in, in I think the, you need to do both, yeah. but until I understand physically what the neurons are doing, I yeah. won't trust the math. I won't trust like, well, yeah, okay, maybe it's an eigenvector thing, blah, 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 maybe. Maybe I'll get some insight from that, but I can't, but I, I, I gotta get, I end up, I have to come back to the biology. I have to have, it's like, okay, these cells are doing this and they're connecting this way to these part of the dendrites and that's why it's worked. I, 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 I understand, and, and, yeah. and, and that, that's fair. I, I would just say that if you have a representation of the math, what you're talking about is there are constraints on what we could say about that representation, which you're, you're trying to intuit from, you know, what does the biology tell you? But I think it's expressible in there as a, as a set of overlapping constraints that say, what actually is happening is this is constrained in the following fashion for these following reasons. And that's, that's something that yeah. could bridge to the Maybe. ML community. You know, it's possible that, you know, I always use the example of a computer, right? The computer, the CPU, when the computer works, I can understand it from an engineering point of view, but it's really difficult to put any kind of mathematics on it. And, um, and so maybe there's some parts you can, you can play standard information theory, you can apply uh, bus, the mathematics of how buses work and, the, and, and so on. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't, it, but you can't, you gotta understand how it works at like the bit level and registers and you know, accumulators yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Um, Cause that's, I mean, that's I mean, really the bottom description. That's the way that's how it works. At, what we have, we have in electrical engineering is, is, a, is a methodology that says, as long as you have signals this large with respect to the noise like this, you can, you can actually go and depend upon it to a certain amount so then you can discard the rest of the stuff and kind of move forward. Yeah, exactly. That's why I mentioned Shannon, information theory, right? Like, right. These things are important, but on their own, they won't give you any clue how a computer works. No. You just I, won't know how a computer works. It's, so again, uh, it, it needs, uh, you know, you've got to have both, but which one leads is the question for me. So I okay. think, it, how do you, you know, we have to understand what's going on and then the math can come along and tell us, it, it can inform us like, oh, we have a clear explanation for it. Um, I mean, just take, okay, this, like, take this idea that, you know, we're really dealing with movement vectors. There's no way that a mathematical analysis, I think would have told you that. There's just no way. You, you could do all the math you want on spaces and you would never come up with that idea. But a simple observation about what you see when you're watching a video game does it. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, it's just a bias of mine, but, but it's, it's more than a bias. I think it's actually an essential component. So again, I welcome that analysis. That's why I want to read the paper. Um, but I, you have to always, the problem is so many people find the biology difficult, and it is difficult, that they want to just go back and rely on the mathematics. Um, and, but that's never going to work. You, you can't rely on it. You have to, you've got to have both. That's, that's my, uh, that's, that's more than a bias. I, it's a certainty <laughs> in my mind. So um, it's, it's one of the premises of the method. I guess, keep it that way. Um, uh, two thoughts not really directly related to uh, that de the debate of math or anything. Uh, so the first one, hopefully this is the quicker one. Um, you brought up displacements and this under this new 
regime under this new paradigm, whatever you want to call it. Uh, that's a that's a fun idea. Uh, if, if I mean, um, at the risk of having collapsed your idea down too much right now, uh, I'm right now I'm picturing a space, maybe 2D, maybe 3D, maybe a, some other relatively low number with sensory inputs being mapped into it. Uh, and and the dimensions of that space are kind of like your flow dimensions. Um, and, but it's still low dimensional. So there's something missing there because if every, if every mini column is an, is an entire dimension, that's very high dimensional. There's, no, there because must be remember they're, 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 they're not orthogonal. They're, they're, okay. It's over complete yeah. basis set, right? Yes. I, okay. I, you got it. Got it. Got it. Cool. Uh, you, that, that explains it then. Then, uh, so th the fun idea here is like being able to, so when we talk about displacement cells and their ability to do composition, uh, we've compared them to wormholes. We've compared them to just like taking spaces and putting them on top of each other and, and lining them up. And um, that ability combined with this is, uh, it sounds magical and interesting. And it sounds um, like it would be part of, um, um, you would want your spaces to be alignable. You would want to be able to map them on top of each other. And th so that would be another one of your learning constraints. That would be another one of your things that um, tells you where something should be mapped into the space. Okay, I where, do not remember comparing them to wormholes and spaces mapped on top of one another like that. So maybe it's funny, that was... no, I, I think the only wormhole comparison actually was in one of Matt's videos. Uh, in, in one of them, when he discussed displacement cells, he, he said, and, and he was like, and I managed to describe the whole thing without mentioning wormholes. <laughs> and then he just moved on. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't remember the, even the lining of the two spaces. I mean, what I remember was, um, I mean, displacement of representation is essentially an invariant representation. And, um, and, and then what I'm proposing now is that this is done in one dimension. So even if I had 10 cells, let's say I have 10 cells that represent um, the different path integration neurons that are cycling through this one dimensional uh, movement vector. So I go from one, two, three, four, five, up to 10, back to one again. So it's cycling through over and over again. Um, then I would have 10 displacement cells. Um, and they would be displaced. And so I still have to figure out how to learn that, but the hell of a lot easier than the two dimensional spatial uh, displacement cells. And, and, so, um, uh, and so I'd have to basically, one of those displacement cells represents any sort of, you know, get movement of two or whatever it is in the 10 or above or something like that. Uh, so to me, the, each displacement is a one dimensional displacement vector, um, which is much easier to calculate. And, and I'm, I'm going back to this idea that every mini column is its own dimension because then I have enough of them. I could have 200 to 900 mini columns in a, in a column and each one would be like a, a 10 cells, one dimension uh, path integrator and displacement thing. And so now, now I have this huge representational capacity because um, I have so many of these mini columns, even though each one only has 10 cells. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know if I don't know if I'm even related to what you said because I don't understand how you put these two spaces on top of one another. If I did, when, I would you have two, two one dimensions. We, yeah, we're kind of having the conversation of one grid cell module versus multiple modules. One grid cell module displacements are easy; you don't think of them as stacking on top of each other. But when you have like a big multi-module code, suddenly you have a big space, and you're and you have like a a, a map of a coffee cup and a map of a, a of a logo, and when you're um, when you learn the displacement between them, uh, you're sort of taking those two spaces and aligning them properly. This, you're taking those two maps and aligning them properly. Yeah, although, you know, it's funny, I, the way I've been thinking about this lately, I realized that we, we want to say, oh, there's a bunch of dimensions which define a space. And now I have the space and I can think about it. Um, the way I've been thinking more like is like, I never really, that, that larger space doesn't really exist. It's just a whole bunch of one dimensional things. And each one dimensional thing calculates its own thing. And, um, oh, I can look at the set of them and I can say, oh, here's where I am. But actually when it comes to movements and when it comes to figuring out displacements and when, when it comes to like, how do I update my, 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 um, my cells, I don't think of the larger space. I only have to think about my one dimension. Um, 
you know, I remember I used to draw in pictures where I said, okay, well, if we want to know where we're going to be when we move, we have to know orientation. So I would say we have to have grid cells, and we have to have orientation cells, we have to be combined some way to get to the next location. I don't think I have to do that anymore. I just have to have this one dimensional thing and it path integrates based on flow information. If, and if the, if the whole thing rotates, the flow information changes and nobody actually has to think about the entire space as in terms of a metric. I think, of, I think of the entire space in terms of assigning some, you know, uh, location, but all the updating of the space, these are just independent vectors. This goes back to the, the you know, the bird example, where I can say, like, I can have a space of birds, but it's not, it, all that matters is each individual dimension has to work on its own, and nobody has to think about how all these dimensions fit into some larger n-dimensional space. Um, it's only when I want to represent a point in that larger dimensional space that I look at all the individual pieces, but all the metric properties, distance, path integration, so on, motor behavior is all independent, which is a, a very freeing concept. I no longer have to figure out how to combine these things. I don't know if that helps. I don't know if that's even related to what you said. <laughs> so. Somewhat. Uh, I'll jump to my second thing, and uh, now hopefully my second thing is the shorter thing. Uh, so, um, on the topic of the metric of this space, um, we're treating it less like the metric is, you know, meters. It's not, it's not some, it's not some fixed metric map, but maybe there is a metric, uh, but it's more something else. One easy thing that comes to mind is time. Uh, two things that are at, uh, 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 the distance between two points in this space is the typical amount of time that passes between them. But why, why would you do it that way? Why wouldn't you say there's a distance and then the time varies by how quickly I move? Well, yes, it, it's, like, it's like controlling for how quickly. Uh, it's, it's like if you, if you control for how quickly you're moving, then you want everything to be equally spaced according to a, you know, clock time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so funny thing a, there is a metric, but it's for time. So you, so you can use it for planning, see how long it'll take to get to a place, yes. which lets yeah. you value like, shoot, which yeah. path is best. Uh, that would be true. Uh, it's funny, thing, you know, think about like, I want to get from point A to point B and I do the displacement, all of my, all of my different um, uh, dimensions. Well, the ones that represent orientation will just say, oh, you, need to, you need to turn this much. <laughs> you know? And the other one says, you need to go, you need, or, you know, once you turn, you have to go, or, I, I, the interaction, but I think it's like, oh, given where I am right now, if, I'm a, if I was a linear uh, dimension, and I'm, and I'm linear dimension, I'm not pointing in the right direction right now. So my displacement says, you don't have to move at all. But as soon as the, as soon as the orientation direction starts moving, then my linear direction says, oh, no, I do have to start moving in this direction. I want to point out this, this, this leads to, this is again the separation of all these different movements. I don't have to coordinate. It, each little column on its own, mini column on its own, figures out, well, should I be moving now or not? And as things move, they all sort of update until everyone heads in the right direction. <laughs> so um, I don't know. These are really hard things to think about. Um, anyway, I, I, I don't even know how to begin writing this up. I've tried writing this up already. I'm going to work on uh, next. I think I'm going to try to understand the scaling issue better. It's clearly going to involve the thalamus and this change in um, speed of the theta rhythm. Um, and so all this has to be solved at once, I think, to get this to work. I don't know. I don't think it should be too difficult to write it up. Um. <laughs> Well, I haven't been able to. I, I wrote up several things so far, and I'm looking at it going, this is garbage. <laughs> yeah, I think the language has to be a little more precise and stuff, but it seems like... Well, it's like, what, what approach... I think the concepts are pretty... It's just hard to think about, like display, display, displacement vectors, for example. It's just hard to think about differences in movement. You know, it's just because movement itself is are already different. It's just a little bit harder to think about, but it seems like... It should be it should be possible to describe it very clearly. But what what is this? What is this a story about mini comms? Is it a story about spaces? Is it a story about, um, um, you know, I mean, isn't it, about architecture? Mini, isn't it about how mini columns represent space and and the world, the structure of the world? And I guess you could call it that movement, as movement vectors or flow vectors. But yeah, um, I mean, take that would be the approach. It's like how many columns represent. Space yeah, in the world. something like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. I'll, I mean, I'll think about that one. But there's so many moving pieces. Um, 
But but is it? What is, I mean, I don't know. But the, you see, you like, know, the whole the whole idea of displacement cells is something that hardly anybody knows about, even though it's in one of our papers. It's you know it's, right. Um, and um, I, I don't. I guess it's movement vectors. If you're holding displacements of movement vectors constant, that's like you you have an acceler. It's it's like just saying that the acceleration vector is is always fixed. You know, so you can have. Ah, uh, I didn't follow that. Right, because there's differences in, in movements. What, what, displacements? Yeah. Displacements just how far I have to, have to move in one dimension of my movement, right? That's all it is. It's well, like, if, uh, if our mini columns are representing movements, then displacements wouldn't be, the, at least the way we did it before, would be differences in how we move. It would be different. It would literally be, be if, I, if I have to move two cells forward, then the displacement is two cells forward. You know, it's like, no matter where I am, I got to move two cells forward. Or if, so if I'm, if I'm turning left two cells, meaning, you know, two path integration cells, if you will, then no matter where I am, I have to turn left two cells. That's a displacement. Um, so it doesn't, you know, so the idea is I'm looking at the coffee cup, whatever my orientation to the coffee cup is, the orientation of the logo is going to be two cells rotated. Doesn't matter, you know, anything else. Well, like, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm going to but, but that's not, that's not displacements and movements. That's it, just, it, that's just a movement. That's just uh, like. It, it's, it's a displacement in the, in the way we defined it in the paper that you have a path integration system and the displacement is, uh, is a relative movement independent of a location in that path integration system, right? So if it's, it's you know, in the 2D sense, it was two cells over and one cell up or something like that. Um, yeah, where, I think that works, that works if, if, you're, if you're representing static location, but here we're, our, our each mini column is representing a flow. So it's, it's representing a movement. It's representing a, a movement. So, so you don't need, if you, all you're talking about rep, is representing a constant shift, you don't need displacements really. Well, how, else, how else can I do that? I mean, it's just the it, value of the mini column. It's just, it's the, no, it's not the value of the mini column. It's, it's, I mean, it's just, it says, it says imagine I have a, a bunch of cells represent orientation, right? It says, no matter what your current orientation is, you want to do two shifts to the left. No matter right. what it is, so it's a it's an environment representation of movement in that in that path integrator. So from right. wherever you are, it doesn't matter. It's a relative shift from wherever you are. Yeah, but if your mini columns are representing movement, then the SDR of the current set of active mini columns will represent that shift. You don't need anything else. No, no, they won't. They won't represent that shift. The, the SDR of the current set of mini columns just tells you which how you're moving right now. Right. Yeah, but that pattern of bits is it's going to be the same regardless of what your starting point is, right? It's just the movement. But I'm, I'm not even trying to imagine, I'm not even moving. Now. I'm trying to represent the, the logo to the coffee cup, right? And I'm trying to go from one space to another space. Um, yeah, I'm just saying if that's what you want to do, I don't think you need displacement vectors the way we defined it before. God, I, I don't, I'm not convinced. I, and you have to explain it to me better. Because it seems to me that I think it's much simpler. If every, if every mini column is just a, a movement, it, it just you know, it's it's a scale. Every mini column is a path integrator. It, that's what it is. It's just a path yeah. integrator. Yeah. So you have and and how quickly you move through your active cells is depending on the velocity of your movement along that direction. So it's no different than before. It's it's just like a two dimensional grid cell, except that these are one dimensional cells, right. and they're not representing spatial dimensions. They're representing something else. So I, yeah. the same principle. If I want to form an environment, uh, well, either an environment representation of an object, or if I want to assign the location of one object to another object, then it seems like the displacement is the thing I need. I need to, I need to say, how much do I, to go from one, I'm looking at a point on the coffee cup, and I want to get a point on the logo. Um, I have to, I have to accommodate all the different, uh, I have to, I, I don't know how to describe it, in other words, I have to I have to learn the, the relative displacement of every one of those vectors because I don't know what my current orientation to a coffee cup is, right? Um, okay, I'm probably missing something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, see how hard. I, I think it's, it's a, you said you said it's easy. I'm saying it's hard. Yeah, well, I thought it was simpler than maybe you're, you're thinking, which may may mean that I'm missing something. Well, I think the I idea think of this everything is a movement vector. I think displacements become really simple. It's just the amount of movement you need. It's just the, you know, do you see what I mean? Yeah, it's the amount of movement you need, but that the amount of movement depends on, 
Um, I mean, it, it, it should. Whereas what it, we did with displacement vectors before was have this sort of elaborate construction of differences in our grid cell representations, right? And that's what's our I, displacement. Here we don't is, need that. This we don't is need no that. different. I don't see why this is any different. Because now, because now the, the locations are, the, the points in this space are each represent a movement. So no, now, they represent my location. Um, right, the, the set of active uh, mini columns will represent a particular movement. Uh, if I understand. Yes, it. but, the, but, but, but remember, if I stop moving, there's a set of cells that stay active that represent where I am. Right. So the movement is just how I update them. It's like grid cells get updated by movement too. Right. We just yeah. assumed that it was movement into X and Y dimensions. I'm saying the movement, you're still, you're still a static cell that represents a location. And when I move that it's updated, but if I stop moving, there's a static cell. So, if I, if I were to look at, uh, if I were to take a flash image and nothing's moving on the screen, then I'd have a set of cells that are active that are, are not really representing movement. They represent a location along the movement direction, movement vector. It's just, but it's a location along that movement. It's just a, it's no different than saying a grid cell represents some uh, repetitive pattern in some linear dimension. Here I have a repetitive pattern in some uh, movement dimension, but it's still a static pattern. If I want to, transfer it to another static pattern, which is another object at that same location, I have to change which cell is active. I have to say, well, how much do I move that cell? I should, I need a new cell that's active because that's the new, the new location. Hmm. Okay. It, it, it's still a space. It still has, it, it, I don't think it works any different than if I had one dimensional um, vectors at X, Y, and Z coordinates. Yeah, I think the one dimension is fine. That's not what's confusing. But me. I'm saying I still need displacement cells. And, and so, just because I'm, my, my, my vectors represent, are, are determined by movement, it doesn't change anything. I'm still representing my location somehow. All right, I, I, I'd like you to be right, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm going, this whole thing is based on the how idea you of- how you, how you got to that physical location will- It doesn't matter. Lead, will lead to the exact same SDR being active, right? That rep, representing that location. So meaning the path integration has to occur, right? You know what you're saying? You're saying there's still a static notion of a static location. It, it, it's, it's the same as before, right? A grid cell represent a set of grid cell modules. If I look at the active cells and a set of grid cell modules, yeah. it represents a static location. Right. So you can now imagine doing that with one dimensional grid cell modules, right? Yeah. And so this is exactly like that. A set of, the set of cells that are active represents a specific location, but it's not, it's, it's a location it's so not, if, it's, if there's a location, so there's still a notion of a location of this point in the pen. It will still translate into, yes. Okay, yeah, I, but if I happen to reach it by moving this way, or if I reached it by moving that way. It has to be the same. It has to be the same. Yeah, um, but, but it will, but it, it, but, except the orientation may be different when you reach it, it depends on, you know. but if you have the single finger on the same spot in the same location, it doesn't matter, you got there. Like, I think everything that applied to grid cells applies here. It's just the difference is that we've always assumed that grid cells represent linear dimensions in physical space. And now I'm saying they represent, quote, in some sense linear, meaning it's, I don't even want to say that. They don't represent, they don't represent linear dimensions in physical space. They represent linear dimensions in movement space. And when I say linear, meaning that a single grid cell mini column always represents the same flow pattern. Okay, there's still some logical inconsistency that I'm having trouble with. I'm not sure. Well, I, uh, maybe, I mean, I, I don't understand this. I'm confused about this, so you're probably right. <laughs> so. Jeff, Jeff, I have a question. So yeah. would, the, would, the, um, would the, the movement cells, would they uh, determine how the, the, the grid cells update the location based on the movement? So there, there, are no, there are no movement cells, okay? The minicom has a general, the cells in the minicom have a general activation level which is greater when you're moving quickly and slower when you're moving slowly or, or lower than when you're moving, right? So, but the, the, the mini column itself represents a, a dimension of movement, but there aren't movement cells. So it's okay. sure, I, I don't see it that way. Um, um, I don't know how to better describe that. Um, but, but the way, the, way the, the, way the, the mini columns are representing the movement, would that uh, determine how the, 
how the grid cells are updating? Well, of course. Um, yes. So, so again, be careful when we say grid cells. People, right, when we think about about grid cells, we're generally talking about a two-dimensional a cell that responds in a two-dimensional matrix in a, in, a, in a planar representation of a space. And these are represented in, your, in the anthropometry. What I'm arguing is that is really an artifact. That's not really what's going on in the cortex or in the, in the hippocampal complex. And, um, but, and so, uh, but clearly as you move, the active cells in each dimension have to change. That's what grid cells do too, right? They change as you move. And that would occur here too, right? The, the mechanisms, this, this um, I didn't bring it up this time, but the whole um, um, oscillatory interference model shows how these cells would progressively become active. A set of cells would progressively become active as you move. And the quicker you move, the quicker they become active, they progress, and then they circle back and do it again, and do it again. That same basic mechanism that's uh, uh, underlying grid cells applies here just as well. It, there's no difference. It's just that the dimension of where your cells are representing are not dimensions of space, but the dimensions of movement in the space. And it could be a linear dimension. I could be going forward and you could say, yes, I'm gonna have a series of cells represent how far I move forward, but it could also be turning or works. I think what would help me is a, is a concrete example of, uh, you know, we can use logo on a coffee cup or some other object, but a uh, set of objects, but you know, here's kind of what the mini columns represent. Here's how I'm moving. Here's how the representation changes. And here's how the location, we don't have to figure out the mechanisms for it, but just understanding the representation I think that would uh, Okay. Well, I've been, I'm working on that. I'm trying to figure out, um, you know, but it, there's a lot of pieces, so I think, to get that right. You know? So, for example, I think, the, I think you have to understand how you go between these upper layers and the lower layers. Um, I think that's going to be part of the solution. Because I think what happens is, I think you go in, the cortex gets its information, and it, it's in this it's very sort of egocentric pose position. I'm using the term to market for pose. And... Um, and so it's like, okay, I'm observing this at a particular direction, a particular distance, at a particular orientation. I now need to quickly switch, I need to convert that to an invariant representation. Um, and um, so I have now this sort of pose egocentric location position and an invariant uh, displacement uh, representation. And these have to go back and forth continually. So um, if I want to get to, you know, so if I update the pose position, I have to update the displacement position. If I want to get to a particular position independent in the, in the model of the object, I have to come back to the pose position. So I think we have to solve this sort of uh, upper layer, lower layer, or wherever it is that's occurring. Um, to, to, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex system to solve the logo thing. So I think it's a good goal. I think you're right. It's a good goal. I'm just, it's, I'm struggling with it. I, and I also have to, I think in order to do it, I have to solve these, the simultaneously, I have to solve the, um, the, the scalar issue. I don't think I can do it independent of the scale issue. So that, I, and I don't have a solution to that yet, so. Um, but, but if each mini column is representing a, a, a flow or a movement at a particular rate of change, right? Wouldn't you yeah. get scale from kind of the overall SDR of, when you look at a whole bunch of these mini columns, each one responsive to different directions and speed, you scale would kind of come out of that. Well, remember, remember again, the mini column activation is the speed, but the actual cells are locations, like the individual cells, grid cells, are not speed dependent, right? They're just sitting there. Right. So I have some, S, I have some very SDR represent of my current location. Um, I, I, it's, it, it, what it requires, it requires that, imagine the upper cells and the lower cells, the upper layers and the lower layers, have to be operating at different speeds, maybe? It's like, um, you know, like if an object is further away from me, I'm looking at it, then to move over the object, I have to move, make smaller movements. If it's close, I have to make larger movements to achieve the same result. So um, somehow I have to take, maybe that's the clue, I have to take some sort of notion about how far away this thing is to judge the, I don't know, is distance and scale are kind of combined together somehow. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if we're making any sense here, but. Um, I, 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 I don't think it's simple, I, I, I hope you're right, but I don't think it's simple. <laughs> it seems complex to me. Every time I try to work it through in detail, I get a little muddied in my head. Um, 
But I think it's a good goal. I, I think inputs might, I was, I was hoping to try to solve this problem in one dimension, like solving a one dimensional scale problem, like a two one dimensional spaces and, um, and trying to figure out how to make that work. And then I could make it work in any other dimension. Um, but I think the idea of like the coffee cup logo thing would be, ideally we could solve that. That would be the, the way of walking through that. Um, well, I, I'm not stuck. <laughs> you know, I'm still working on it. Um, uh, but um, I am finding it difficult, I have to be honest. It's challenging. This would be great to have more uh, whiteboard, whiteboard time. Some example in terms of mini columns and cell rep, even if we don't know exactly where they are, what the mechanisms are, would be helpful to like, what, it, what do you, like one kind of possible instantiation of this. Yeah. Just in I keep finding the biology is very helpful. Like I wouldn't have guessed certain things until I look at the biology and I say, well, the biology says it looks like this. So it must be yeah, no, I'm yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm suggesting sticking with mini columns. Yeah. And, um, yeah, all right. I, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm just, I'm just pointing I out. That, that, yeah, I think the thing I'm confused about is exactly what is the difference between the representation of the movement at any particular point in time and the representation of this, the allocentric location. And how it's, does it's, it like, I don't think it's any different than we thought about grid cells, right? It, it, it's the only difference is that the dimensions of the mini column are not aligned linearly with the space. They're just, they're just, they're, 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 it's, just it's just a line that might curve or screw or whatever. It's a movement space. So um, everything else seems to be applying the same. Um, so this idea that I, I think maybe I've somehow confused people and think like, oh, these represent movements where before grid cells didn't represent movements. No, grid cells were activated by movements. And here too, the cells are activated by movements. It's just that the dimension is a, a typical type of movement as opposed to in the past, we might think of the dimension as a straight line movement through space. Here, it's no longer a straight line movement through space. It could be a turning movement or a screwy movement. It doesn't really matter. It's just whatever is common. So you know, I, I went through all these scenarios like, you can sit there and you say, okay, I can turn my head left and right. I can move sideways through the space. Look, look, my hands are moving relative to my face. You know, there's all these different things you can do that you could detect, um, different types of movements you can detect just by flow pattern. Um, I don't know why I brought that up. It's just like, there's a lot of different ways you can move through space. And this is, this is just trying to capture it. Um, anyway. All right, I'm going to work on it more. Yeah, right. I, I feel like the coffee cup logo one is almost too hard to solve right now. There are problems to solve first before the coffee cup and logo. It just uh, well, you could just do a coffee cup by itself without the without compositionality. It's just yeah, how you yeah. prediction as you're moving around the coffee cup. What but I see, like? I can't think you can do that without the without having the displacement cells. I actually have come to believe you can't really solve the prediction on the coffee cup without displacement cells. You have to have an invariant model of the coffee cup. So, yeah, otherwise you can't do it. Um, so somehow <laughs> I think you got to do the whole thing. I think you could try, here's like, I'll try back again. I'll try again to do, talk, think about simpler objects, think like one dimensional objects. It's easy to think about like, okay, just, I have a, a, a linear track and I have some, um, I have, I, I have two different tracks, if you will, two different one dimensional spaces. And I want to assign one to a location of the other one. Um, it's a bit abstract, but it's easier to deal with. You can just think about it. Um, I don't even know if orientation or any concept of orientation makes sense in this case, but um, but I could try to solve the scale problem using one-dimensional things, and that might um, bring up um, some general concepts. But once you go beyond that, I guess I guess then we could go to like a two-dimensional space, like the like a room with a rug. Remember, we talked about that a lot. Um, I could do that too. That might be maybe more fruitful. The coffee cup is a three-dimensional curve version thing. You know, it's kind of confusing. Um, I, I'm hoping in the end. I, I mean, the dimensionality doesn't bother me. I could go any one of those is fine. It's more like what what does the representation mean at any point, and how do you go from one to the other? That's the piece. Of All right. It. Well, I find it. I I find the dimensionality hard when I start thinking of three-dimensional structures. It gets much harder for me. Um, so I'll, I'll. But I think maybe a happy ground would be a two-dimensional space. Because then I can have a, a variety of um, I could I could if I if I tried to solve the the carpet in the room problem um, then and I think if it's a two dimensional space 
then I might I can I can deal with um, orientation as well as uh, movement linear movement directions, and I might be able to solve that. Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's, I, I hadn't thought about that. That's a good. That's a good one to go back to. Maybe that's maybe that's a good one for me. And then I could kind of crumble up all the different representations you need to, to achieve that. Um, all right. Well, I'll work on that. That's good. I like that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. That's helpful. Okay. You're going to hear more of this, whether you like it or not. <laughs> All right. Bye everyone. All right. We'll see you in a little bit. Some of you. All right. All right. Thanks for the input.